Now hear the word of the Lord from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need of anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep as other do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Hey, good morning, Sojourn. Peace be with you. Good to see you. My name is Paul, like Britt just said. I haven't met you yet. Um, welcome. So glad that you're here. Look forward to meeting you, to hearing your story. So glad that the Lord has brought us together like this this morning. We're continuing a series that we've been going through for some time through the book of First Thessalonians. It was written by the Apostle Paul uh, to this early church in Thessalonica uh, for the purpose of encouraging them. Uh, the Apostle Paul's ministry was really a ministry of explanation. He wrote after the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Apostle Paul wrote most of the rest of the New Testament. Many letters to different churches giving them particular words of encouragement and exhortation to explain to them what it means that Jesus had died, he's, he's risen again, he's ascended into heaven, and we are anticipating his return. So we've been walking through this letter as one great example of that. And this is actually this passage... Uh, is another uh, Im quite impressive passage. It's about the coming day of the Lord. Uh, it's the second in kind of a two set, uh, 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 second of two passages. The one right before this came uh, last week. We took a break from our series. Uh, Tony Viatora from Sojourn Spring Branch preached a wonderful sermon for us. Two weeks ago, we were in the passage immediately before this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul talks about the coming of the Lord Jesus and what's going to happen in today. Paul continues that, threat, that, that thought process by talking about one of the questions that the Thessalonians had evidently asked him to explain. And so Paul's attention is on the things that are to come. Uh, and this is the second of these two passages in which he focuses on the ultimate, the end of all things, the, the, the final consummation. And as we get into this, I think it's important for us to understand, just I want to make kind of one contextual note by way of introduction, um, that Paul understands that these Christians would have understood, and that I think it's important for us to understand before we jump into the text, and that's this. Paul understands, Christians understand that fixing the world is not ultimately up to us. Fixing the problems of the world is not ultimately up to us. Here's what I mean. Christians are called to live faithfully in the world. Right? Christians are called to seek justice, to correct oppression, to provide for the needy, to build the kingdom of God through word and deed. In a sense, it is appropriate to see the commission of the church, the, the, the job of the church in the world as a, a mission of conquest. Right? Building the kingdom of God sent into a world filled with darkness, the church is to push back the darkness in the power of God. With that said, the weapons to be used in this conquest are interesting. We don't use swords and spears or guns or tanks. Instead, Jesus says, you will be my witnesses. Your job is to preach the gospel, to proclaim it, to unleash the power of God in the world through declaring his word, through living the virtues that's, that are the fruits of the spirit. Your conquest is to be engaged through things such as love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, and the like. That doesn't mean, of course, that we do nothing. 
We build houses, both literally and metaphorically. We advocate for the cause of those who can't advocate for themselves. We pursue transformation and cultural renewal. We often do so in the face of opposition, which is sometimes violent. But the truth is, in the face of the problems of the world, our way of participating in the work of God in the world often looks foolish to those around. Uh, you may have seen Star Wars. Uh, episode four is the first Star Wars movie that was ever made. And Star Wars is an excellent analogy story for the gospel. It's this epic battle between light and darkness, the dark side of the force with its evil lords, and then the light side, the right side of the force with the Jedi and the, these kind of Messiah figures. There's this scene in episode four where Obi-Wan Kenobi dies. He has this epic battle with Darth Vader, and it is not just to regular characters, it's the, like the, the, the leader of the dark side and the leader of the light side. And they face off and they're having this lightsaber battle toward the end of the movie. And Obi-Wan Kenobi, the good guy, turns off his lightsaber and stands up and lets Darth Vader kill him. Plot spoiler, sorry. Uh, it's been out for decades, so it's on you. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's this incredible scene where there's this kind of, you, you're, as, as you watch it for the first time, as you engage with it, you watch Luke watch Obi-Wan die and say, what are you doing? Why did you just let him kill you? Because it's clear that Obi-Wan just let it happen. It's like, what? That, that's so foolish. Obi-Wan, you're like the guy. But Obi-Wan made it clear, and as, you, as the movie goes on, as the episodes go on, when they're still continuing to be written, um, you see that the story goes on that Obi-Wan was making way for the one who was to come after him who would be the one to bring balance to the force. That's the salvation narrative. It wasn't Obi-Wan, it was someone who was to come. Similarly, when we engage with the problems of the world with things like peace, patience, love, joy, faith, people often look on and say, what are you doing? What, how could you respond to that person with blessing? How do you respond? How are you at peace in the face of this situation? What do you mean we should be gentle with this person and seek to restore them instead of punish them? It appears foolish to the world, but the, how can we be at peace? How can we live like this? It's because we know that fixing the world is not ultimately up to us. It's not my job to fix other people or to exact vengeance where vengeance is due. It's the job of someone else. I know that fixing the world is not up to me. There's coming a day when all will be made right, and that day was not the day that I came on the scene. but it's another. A day is coming when all will be made right. Verse 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul points to this. Concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything to written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come. This is what Paul is talking about. There is a day of the Lord that is coming when all will be made right. You see, when sin entered the world in the Garden of Eden through Adam and Eve, uh, God said to them, on account of this sin there would be much suffering and pain in the world. They would experience it. All of their offspring, offspring would experience it. But he gives this wonderful promise. He says there's coming a day when evil will be crushed. One will be born, the seed of a woman, and he will crush the head of the serpent, the enemy of God. The enemies will be vanquished, and all will be made right. And as the story of the Bible progresses, we see glimpses, we see foretastes of this promise being fulfilled. In the days of Noah, wickedness has covered the earth, the people of God are under threat, and God sends, pours out his wrath upon the wickedness of the world and preserves his people through Noah and the ark. But that's not the final day of the Lord because we see that sin still remains. Fast forward to the story of the Exodus. God pours out his wrath. He judges Egypt and their gods, and he preserves his people. He leads them out through the Red Sea, but sin is still present. It is a day of the Lord, so to speak, but not the day of the final vengeance of God. Fast forward to when the Israelites enter the promised land, and they, they, it's called the conquest of Canaan. They actually kicked out. They, the, the Lord sends them to judge the nations that are there. They're doing evil. And so God brings judgment on these nations through Israel and their, their military victories. But sin still remains. Fast forward to Jesus. Jesus comes on the scene. The light of the world as he's described. The light has arrived and the, the, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness can't overcome that light. But then he's denied. And he's crucified. He's killed. His own people don't receive him. 
And as a result of that, God sends judgment. He judges Jerusalem for their rejection of the prophet in AD 70. There's this climactic event in history where Jerusalem was judged for, the, for, the, for their refusal to receive Jesus. All of these things, though, so, so you see the judgment of God poured out, the preservation of his line. God is pouring out, and he's giving foretaste of the day that is to come when wrong will be done away with and what is right will remain. But all of these are merely glimpses. Sin and its effects remain a part of the world every single time. There is coming a day, though, that is the final judgment, the final day of reckoning. When the wicked and the righteous will be separated once and for all. Some to everlasting punishment in hell and some to everlasting life in heaven. All that causes pain and suffering will be done away with and only what is good and wonderful will remain. The coming of this day is the day that Paul talks about here. This is the day of the Lord that will come like a thief in the night to some. This is the day of reckoning. It's the day of Jesus' return, which, Jesus has already been, or which Paul has been talking about um, in, the, in the passage leading up to this one at the end of chapter 4. On that day that is coming, God will completely restore all that needs to be restored and do away with all that needs to be done away with. It's not up to us. It's up to him. So we know that this day is coming, but one of the key questions in light of this, and what is probably the questions that the Thessalonians would have asked Paul to provoke him to write this section is, okay, what then? How can we know that we'll be ready for the day of the Lord? How can we know that we'll be ready for the day of the Lord? And in a sense, this is the question that we'll be unpacking for the rest of our time. How can we know that we're ready for it? There's three things we're going to look at as Paul continues in this passage. The first thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at the wrong thing to focus on. The second thing we're going to look at is the right thing to focus on. And the third thing is the only foundation upon which we rest. So first, let's look at the wrong thing to focus on. The first thing we see, and we see this in verses 1 through 3. Uh, it says this, Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So let's pause there. Throughout human history, uh, uh, like I said just a moment ago, humanity has been waiting for this day of reckoning, this day of judgment. And there's been a lot of fascination about the timing of this day. When will this day happen? How will we know that this day has come? Throughout history, there have been writings, there have been books about this, there have been people who have devoted their whole ministries uh, within Christianity to talk about this is how you'll know when the last day is, or this is the date on which Jesus will return, we figured it out. There's this, there's this fascination throughout history with knowing the date, the time that Jesus will return that God will ultimately restore all things. Even in the Bible, we see in Daniel chapter 12, the book of Daniel has some crazy imagery about this last day that is coming. And there's a question there, how long before these astonishing things are fulfilled? Daniel 12 verse six. In the book of Psalms, there's this consistent refrain, how long, O Lord, will the wicked prosper? How long before the wicked are done away with? In Jesus' own ministry, his disciples ask him multiple times, when is this day coming? When is this gonna happen? And this is Paul's response concerning the times and the seasons. You don't need anyone to write anything to you. Paul says, you're not missing any information that you don't already have consider concerning the timing. The short answer is, we don't know. They've presumably asked him concerning times and seasons, which is a technical phrase that means, when is this day going to come? And Paul says, no one knows. He gives two images to describe what he's talking about. He, he talks about a thief in the night and a pregnant woman going into labor. So first he describes the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night. A thief coming in the night is a common image, of course, for surprise. As one writer puts it, the trouble with burglars is that they don't tell you that they're coming. Right? Thieves don't have a habit of sending a warning postcard. Hey, I'm going to be coming at this time on this day, you, so be ready. This is what Paul compares with the coming of the Lord, not that he's comparing the Lord to a thief in character, but that element of surprise, like a thief in the night, it will be unexpected. The second thing he describes, the day of the Lord is coming, is uh, it will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. In this sense, of course, Jesus, uh, or we're also given the sense that the coming of Jesus will be sudden. We'll also give, given the sense that it will be inescapable 
even though it's expected. That's the difference between the thief, is that a pregnant woman going into labor is usually not an unexpected thing. It's a surprise when it happens, but she's been walking through pregnancy for nine months, and so it's, not, it's, a, it's an expected thing, but you just never know. Sometimes there's false starts uh, that show that it's not really labor, but once labor has started, there's no going back. It's inescapable. There's no, just kidding, don't want to do this today. Right? When labor pains come upon a woman, uh, there is no turning back. It is inescapable. And so taking these two images together, the thief and the woman in labor, the labor pains, we get the picture that Christ's coming will be sudden, unexpected, and unavoidable. While we do know it's coming, so in that sense it's expected, and we know that there will be no escape, we don't know when. It will come with no warning, is what Paul is saying. And Paul's building on the teaching of Jesus himself, who, when he was talking about the coming day of judgment, said in Matthew 24, concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus says, I don't even know when this day is going to come to his disciples. After his resurrection and just before his ascension, after he said these words, his disciples ask him again. So he's, okay, you've died and risen again. It's the last question they ask him before he ascends into heaven, right at the beginning of Acts chapter 1. They come and say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're like, is this the day when you're going to make all things right and you're going to get all the enemies out of here and this is going to be the kingdom forever? And Jesus says the same thing. He says, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. You see that phrase? Same phrase that Paul uses in our passage. It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. There's been so much focus throughout the centuries over when this is going to happen. There's a lot of curiosity and speculation as to when Jesus is going to happen, and it's a tempting thing to focus on, but Paul says it's a waste of time. It's the wrong thing to focus on because no one knows this is the first thing Paul addresses in the passage. Evidently, they have asked them about it, and his response is, you don't need any more information because there is none to give. Let, remi- let me remind you, he says. He says, you already know this. You yourselves are fully aware that it will come like a thief in the night. Nobody knows it, not even Jesus knew it, and so you, you know this, brothers and sisters. And he says, don't listen to anyone who tells you that they do know. E- evidently, even after this letter is received by the church in Thessalonica, it's still a question. And so, because in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2 begins this way. Paul writes again about the last day. He says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way. He goes really hard at this issue. Don't be deceived brothers and sisters. If anyone tells you the day of the Lord is here, they're lying. There's a terrible story that was released in the last month or two about a, a, a cult leader in Kenya named Paul Ntenga McKenzie, right? An awful man who said the, the return of the Lord is imminent, and he's, you, you may have seen this in the news, where something close to 250 people have died of starvation. They've starved themselves because Jesus is coming back. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. That was the lie. He said, I know when Jesus is coming back. And because people were tempted to believe him, they uh, uh, they were deceived. This is what Paul is talking about. Think about any other cult leader. This is the lie. David Koresh, Jim Jones, uh, the Heaven's Gate cult. These are all cult leaders who said this, who made this very error. They said, we know when he's coming back. Either someone lying and saying, I am Jesus who has come back, or someone saying, this is the time, this is how we get ready because Jesus is coming back soon. This is the lie. So Paul says, don't be deceived. What's you know, it's, it's a good, Paul doesn't make light of the question. It's a biblical question. When, it's an understandable question. When is Jesus going to come back? And Paul says, you already know what you need to know. The wrong thing to focus on is trying to set a date. But you don't need to know because here is how you won't be surprised. Moving to point two. The wrong focus is trying to set a date. The right focus is simply stay awake and remain prepared. 
So even though we don't have an answer to the when question, there is a way not to be surprised when Jesus comes. Look at verse four. Paul says, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You don't have to be surprised like a thief, is what Paul says. Think of why a burglar might take you by surprise. First, he comes unexpectedly at the, in the night. And second, you're asleep and unprepared for his arrival. You can't do anything about the first. You can't do anything about a thief surprising you. But what you can do, you can do something about the second. You can remain awake and be vigilant and be prepared. That's, this is what Paul is saying. And to explain the image that he goes on to give, he starts talking about light and darkness. You are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to come upon you. And then he talks about light and darkness. And I think to understand what Paul's talking about, it would be helpful uh, to consider for a moment a theology of light. In the Old Testament, in the days before Jesus, the Bible divided time into two ages. The present age was evil, and the age to come was to be the time of the Messiah. This is how the Old Testament in general divided time. Two ages, the present age and the age to come. Um, the age to come was when the Messiah would come. As one writer puts it, the present age was like a long, dark night. But when the Messiah came, the sun would rise, the day would break, and the world would be flooded with light. This is a common image throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, which reveals Jesus as that long-awaited Messiah, we see that this age to come began when Jesus came. When Jesus arrived, he brought about the kingdom of God. He brought with him the daytime. He was the rising sun, cre uh, flooding creation with his light. In John chapter 1, uh, the apostle John introduces Jesus in terms of light. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John the Baptist, uh, different from the apostle John, who came to bear witness about Jesus, we're told, came to bear witness about the light which Jesus brought into the world. John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, sings this wonderful song when John the Baptist was born, and it ends this way. It says, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit from us on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. My son, this is Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, my son is going to point at the person who's going to bring this light. In other words, with the coming of Jesus, the sunrise has visited us. Light has come into the world. With that said, we are in, very clearly, the overlap of these two ages. There wasn't a clean break between the age, this present age, and the age to come, as the Old Testament uh, talked about. Those two ages are there, but there's an overlap. In this overlap, there are those who belong to the old age and those who belong to the new. First John chapter 2, we read that the darkness is passing away, not that it has already passed away, but the darkness is actively passing away and the true light is already shining. In Hebrews 6, we read that some have tasted and seen the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. 1 Peter 2 tells us that those people who have tasted those powers are, have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So though the present dark age is fading away, it's not yet gone, the light is also present. Both ages exist. They're on top of one another. That's what Paul is talking about here. There are those who are awake, Thessalonians, and there are those who are asleep. There are children of darkness and there are children of light. That is the age in which we find ourselves. It's only when Jesus comes back that the age of darkness will end finally. Any and all that will remain is the kingdom of light. And so as we live and love and enjoy one another and enjoy God and and build houses, both real and metaphorical, what will remain? There are good things that will remain. All that is not built on the foundation of Christ will be done away with. Why does Jesus delay? Why this overlap? Second Peter 3, the apostle Peter tells us that, it's, that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, as though he somehow forgot to close the, the previous age. But he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So why this overlap of ages? Why this long delay for the second coming of Jesus? It's for the sake of proclaiming the gospel so that people can be led out of darkness and into the marvelous light of Christ. That's the reason for this age. 
But you, so with this understanding of light in mind, we have a basis for understanding Paul's imagery concerning light and darkness. But you, we read, starting in verse 4, in reading through verse 8, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you're already in the daytime. You are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So there's a lot here. There's in the, right in the heart of this section, um, Paul gives two critical exhortations to the Thessalonians, and they're right there in verse 6. Rather than sleeping as others do, let us keep awake and be sober. So first, what does it mean to keep awake? Here, Paul is, of course, bringing us back to the thief in the night image. While you can't do anything about a thief coming at a surprising time, you can stay awake and be ready. You know, if only a burglar would just come in the daytime when I'm awake and sober and ready to, Paul says, it'll be similar with the coming of Jesus. We don't know when he's going to come. That's why we must remain awake at all times. Keeping awake uh, uh, brings with it a vigilance that is, is associated, that, that's associated with soldiers. Right, so, and looking down at verse 8, uh, Paul describes that Christian virtues, faith, hope, and love, are tantamount to donning armor, to putting on armor. And so why the vigilance and protective armor? Because life is a battle in this in-between age, where the new age has broken in already, but the final consummation has not yet happened. The world is filled with darkness, Paul says. And this would have been a poignant image for the Thessalonians. It's, a common, you know, it's common in the New Testament to have daytime light associated with sobriety and readiness, and for nighttime and darkness to be associated with all kinds of sins. It's quite different for us today, where going out at night is commonly thought of as an exciting thing. Um, before streetlights, nighttime was thought to be a horrible and sinister time. Uh, now, does this mean that we should go back to understanding the nighttime in this way? I don't think so. I don't think that's a necessary conclusion here. Um, although my camp director, I remember when I went to summer camp growing up, and we, I was a camp counselor, and our curfew was 10 o'clock. And the reason the camp director gave for that was nothing good happens after 10 o'clock. And so that's kind of dr drilled into us as camp counselors. Nothing good happens at nighttime. So he's touching on this concept. I don't know that that's necessary to hear me say that. Um, but there's also maybe wisdom there at times. Um, if we understand what Paul is actually saying, we don't need to go back to how things were back then and see the night as evil and terrifying, but we do need to capture and understand the image that Paul is using. This was a time where the only reason one would be out at night would be to do something illicit, as one of the uh, illicit, meaning inappropriate, illegal, sinful. As uh, one of the early church fathers, John Chrysostom, said this, he said, for it's just as corrupt and wicked men do all things as in the night, escaping the notice of all and enclosing themselves in darkness. For tell me, does not the adulterer watch for the evening? And the thief for the night. Does not the violator of the tombs carry on all his trade in the night? It was at nighttime that Jesus himself was denied, convicted, and, betra and uh, uh, betrayed. Do not live in darkness, darkness like this, Paul says. Live in the light as children of the light. Keep awake. Secondly, be sober. Verse 6, so let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober goes on in verse 7, for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So you see the picture here. Don't sleep as others do. They go out at night thinking that what they're doing is making them more alive. It's waking them up. But really those activities, Paul says, are putting them to sleep. They're numbing them to reality. This is what drunkenness is and does. Certainly Paul has in view here the abuse of alcohol. But in the context of Scripture, being sober also, nearly always, if not always, carries with it a metaphor of sober-mindedness in general. In this way, we see that this passage isn't just a teaching for some who struggle with the abuse of alcohol. This is a passage, this is a teaching for the whole church. Some are in addiction recovery for alcoholism. All are in sober-mindedness school. 
Self-control is a fruit of the Spirit that applies to all Christians. And alcohol is not the only threat to sobriety. The battle for self-control, for sober-mindedness is a real one. Think about what draws your attention most readily. It may be alcohol or other drugs that inebriate. It may also be uh, things that tickle your ears or titillate your eyes, things that incite your heart and flame it with anger or lust or envy or gossip. These are often things that promise to wake you up. Ah, oh, this is what you've been missing. Did you know? But are these things that lead to peace, quietness of spirit, kindness, sacrificial love? What are the things that most readily excite us? Darkness is a metaphor for moral indifference to sin. It's not simply staying in at night and not drinking. It is taking sin seriously that Paul is talking about when he says live as children of light. Be aware of the temptation to explain away sin. To enjoy it and then to look around and see, oh, everybody else is sleeping. It's fine if I sleep. I don't sleep as much as they do. Paul says, don't fall for it. Don't look around and see others sleeping as an excuse for sleeping yourself. Keep awake, stay sober. And why? What has Paul been talking about this whole time? Because Jesus could come back at any moment. There's a number of ways that we could consider this, but I wanna, I'll give this as just a personal example of where this passage has been really meaningful in my life. I remember when I was in college, um, and I was, I was a brand new believer. I was saved in my freshman year of college. Um, and I did abuse alcohol in college. Um, and then I remember very vividly my sophomore year, our pastor in college preached this sermon. And my pastor was not like a fire and brimstone guy. He was, he was a sweet, mild-mannered, excellent teacher. But he preached on this passage. And he said, this is why you don't get drunk. Not because it will send you to hell. Because getting drunk is not what sends you to hell. This is why you don't pursue those things, because Jesus could come back at any moment. In what state do you want to be found when Jesus comes back? Christians, you have available to you this hope and love and peace that you can live in so that when you hear the trumpet sound, you can look up because it's already daytime and you're ready to see him. Or you can be caught off guard and thrown into a panic. How do you want to be found when Jesus returns? And if we're honest... This is somewhat terrifying. God could come back at any moment. This is why every moment counts. Paul's writing, every moment, be awake at all times. God could come back, so let's remain awake and sober so that we're ready when he comes. Otherwise, we'll be numbered with the ones who won't escape the judgment, we might think. But that's not actually... Uh, uh, what Paul says. It's not what Paul says at all. Let's read starting again in verse 8. Paul writes this. He says, But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So you see what Paul says here. As we're moving from the second point into the third point, the essential foundation. Do you see what he says here? He says, we belong to the day. And why? Is it because we're vigilant? No, that's not what Paul says. Because God has not, it's because God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the thing that we must see Paul saying in this passage. You are not saved by your vigilance. There are people who have not remained vigilant the whole time and who will be in heaven. There are people, there's at least one person in scripture who probably didn't have a single moment of vigilance in his whole life. The thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus, who Jesus spoke words of forgiveness and promise saying, I'll see you today in paradise. You will not be saved from the coming day of the Lord by your vigilance. How will you be ready? How will you make make it through this day of judgment. 
if Paul had left his thoughts here at simply being sober-minded and alert, that does not lead to assurance. It's up to me now, right? I got to stay awake so that I'm ready when he comes because I don't want to be like one of those who's left behind by the rapture because I wasn't ready when Jesus came. How can you know that you'll be saved by the wrath of God? Saved, excuse me, from the wrath of God? Because it's not what God has destined for you, is what Paul says. Because God, because Christ died for you so that you might live. This is the one place in this whole letter of Thessalonians where Paul explicitly states the purpose for Christ's death on the cross. Did you see that? What was Christ's death for? Christ, verse 10, who died for us. That, those two words, this is the only place in this letter where Paul makes this explicit. And here's what he means. Christ's death was not for his own benefit. It was for ours. This is the crux of the gospel. Here's what Paul is communicating. This day of judgment is coming. They're asking, how can we be ready? And Paul says, you are already ready. You don't have need for anyone to write anything else to you because you're already children of the light. It's not going to do much for you if you spend your whole life being ready with your bow and arrow only to meet an army, the army of the Lord, coming on with an onslaught to erase sin and wickedness. I don't care how ready you are, but if you try to take that on yourself, you will fail. You're not saved by your vigilance. You're saved in Christ. The only hope you have is in Christ. How do you become a child of the light? Paul doesn't say, because you've found the light, you're ready. That's not how Paul says it. He says, you are children of light. You were born, which is something that you didn't manufacture yourself. Babies don't birth themselves or decide to be born. It happens to them. You are children of light, Paul says. God has destined you for salvation, which comes through new birth, by the grace of God alone, through nothing that you have done, but purely because of his love. So in this way, you see that remaining awake and sober-minded isn't the thing which saves us, but it is simply the wonderful and loving response to the salvation that God offers us in Christ. Our life now is not about knowing the date of Jesus' return, because then we'll be able to set our alarm clocks and wake up in time. We're not saved from the day of wrath by vigilance. It's not about knowing the date. It's about living in the light. And what is that light? It's Christ himself. Not a general moral uprightness, but a right living that comes from life in Christ. And what does it look like? It's important to see that in the, uh, here near the end of the passage, Paul doesn't just leave it at, okay, now, because of what Christ has done, just keep awake and be sober. He doesn't leave it at just that. Um, because just seeing, okay, I need to awake, be awake and not live in the darkness of sin. I need to be sober and not be drunk. He doesn't just leave it as negative, like avoid these things. He actually gives us a positive description of what it looks like to live life in pursuit of this alertness and sobriety. Verse eight, you probably caught it. But since we belong to the day, Paul says, let us be sober. How? Having put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. Faith, Paul, Paul points us to faith and hope and love. This is known as, well, it's, I call, I'd like to call this the Pauline triumvirate. This is the three things that Paul touches in each of his letters. If you notice this, go read, if you're interested this week, just go read all of Paul's letters real quick. Uh, you could do it, um, but you'll notice in every one of his letters, he comes back to these three things with, I think, one exception. I can't remember which one it is, but like, Every one of these letters is about faith, hope, and love. And in Thessalonians, usually to churches, it's, they're not doing well with one of them. He says, I see your faith, I see your hope, but you have not love. That's his word to the Corinthians. I see your hope, I see your love, but have faith, he says to the Ephesians. Right? So there's usually, he's usually addressing one of the three. To the Thessalonians, he says, you have these things already. You don't need me to write anything else. Just keep these on as armor in the battle that you're in. Every letter comes back to these things. Faith which can be understood as dependence on something outside of yourself for salvation. Hope in trusting that there is coming a day when all things will be made new and it's not gonna be your responsibility, but it is coming. Love, which means you haven't been given nothing to do, you've been given an active part in what God is doing in the world right now by loving him and loving others. Consider the absence of these things. What kind of life is it to live if it is marked by unbelief 
or despair or hatred. Usually, it's not as explicit. You usually don't have a person who thinks, oh yeah, that's definitely me. I'm in unbelief and despair and hatred. Think about the counterfeits for faith, hope, and love. Confessing with the mouth only. I remember as a, as a new believer in college, um, I remember one of the things, one of the dominoes that I had to follow was I had to realize that just because people said things didn't mean that they were true because I watched people confessing with their mouths and then living lives no different from the world. And I remember before I was a Christian thinking, I wanted no part of that. The counterfeit faith is just saying things with your mouth that you don't believe with your heart. Counterfeit hope is optimism or cynicism. Two sides to the same coin. You may have heard this before. The optimist who lives their life thinking, um, and as an optimist, right, uh, lives their life thinking, oh, everything's going to work out fine. The optimist lives in a fantasy world of his or her own devising and thinks, oh, it's, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, as a way of avoiding the pain of the real world. The cynic does the same thing, just in the opposite direction. The cynic's fantasy world is, oh, I just, I, I didn't expect it to go well anyway, so didn't hurt me. It's a way of protecting yourself from pain, because if you just assume, if you set your expectations really low, then you won't be hurt when the worst happens. Right? Both the optimist and the cynic can make themselves feel like, oh yeah, you know, it might happen, and it looks different in, in both situations, but that's a way to, to avoid. Those are counterfeit hopes. I'll be okay, says the cynic, because even if the worst happens, I'll be fine. I'll be okay, says the optimist, because even if the wor worst happens, we'll be fine. Hope is not in yourself. True hope is in the Lord who is bringing the day of salvation. And then counterfeit love is very easy to, to see. It's white-knuckled or begrudging service. Gosh, I just know I'm going to serve others so that they know that I'm doing this for them, so that God sees it. Right? I don't want to, but I'm going to do it anyway. Now there's a sense in which it could be love. Or, or, or these could, all of these counterfeits that I'm kind of uh, 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 going through, these are things that are real struggles for Christians. These are real things that pop up in our lives. But when we look to Christ, we see that Christ is the perfect demonstration of faith, hope, and love. He did not confess with his mouth only. He was true to his word. He said, not my will, but yours, to his Father in heaven, and then he took the cross, even uh, though he didn't want to. He was a man of his word. He truly believed that his Father could raise him from the dead. His belief was that, uh, uh, his b belief was in his father's power to raise him. He didn't take the optimistic or the cynical view. He took the view of the true realist, not the cynicist who calls himself a realist. He, the true realist, the one who made and upholds reality by the word of his power, took things terribly seriously. And he demonstrated that even through suffering, death does not win, that the victory is secure in him. And then Jesus in him, of course, we see the truest picture of love. Greater love knows no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends, that as they were killing him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Faith, hope, and love converge for us on the cross at the apex of history. The climactic event of history has happened. The future is sure. We know salvation. Eternal life is here. The kingdom is at hand. We are simply waiting for its full consummation. We don't know when it will be but we know that it will come, and so we remain awake. And how do we remain awake? We pursue faith, hope, and love. Every per and so here's the question that I would leave you with. Every person in here has a narrative other than faith, hope, and love that is most tempting for you, that threatens your sobriety. Every person here Probably, if, you're, if we're honest, we could sit and unpack how each person in here struggles with all three of them. But let's, for today, just I'd ask you, which of those three things is your heart most inclined to believe a different narrative than true faith, true hope, true love? For me, um, anger and hatred is not the one. So love is a narrative that I find personally easy to believe. I don't know that it's character as much as just temperament. Patience is something that comes more naturally to me than for others I've found. What is harder for me is faith. The faith that I'm protected by someone else and that I don't need to protect myself. Um, whether through consumption or finding the approval of others, I believe a lot more in myself and my abilities to protect myself than I should. 
So every time we come in on Sunday and we sing songs about faith, I sing in earnest, asking the Lord to give me the faith to believe the words that I sing. I need to be reminded that there is one gospel, that Christ is the foundation on which my hope is built, because living my way, the way of self-protection and self-sufficiency, doesn't work. It leads to exhaustion and stress, and it negatively affects hope and love. You see, these things all work together, so the question is, what is it for you? What is the narrative in, in your life as you look at the world? What, what is it that makes you think there is peace and security? Right? That's how Paul says it. He says, there are those who will be saying there is peace and security, and the day will come like a thief in the night to those people. Of course, in the background of there is the image of the Roman Empire and the Pax Romana, if you guys remember your ancient world history, with the Roman peace that the, that the emperor was, was able to, the Caesar was able to secure for us. And so there's peace and security. Christians, what are you talking about? We have peace and security. And Paul says, oh, you don't see what's actually happening. There is coming a day. What is that peace for you? Because here's the thing. If your trust is in peace and security in this world, it will be taken from you on this final day and you'll be left without recourse or hope. That's what Paul is saying in this passage. Don't be fooled. Comparing to labor pains is strange in a world today in which many of the dangers of childbirth have been mitigated, but people died from labor pains all the time, and it happened all of a sudden. And so the image of labor pains and their danger was real and clear for these people in a way that it is less so for us today. There's no just kidding when labor comes on. It's inevitable and inescapable. And so where have you taken on the way of the world? What, where have you taken on the narrative of the world around you, the narrative of the world of darkness that is actually keeping you asleep but masquerading itself as wakefulness? And what does it look like to take that realization and rather than sitting in shame on account of that false narrative, on account of the promises from the world around that you've taken up and you've given yourself to, what does it look like instead of sitting in shame, just turning back to the one who hasn't destined you for wrath, but who has made you a child of light, invited you to pursue faith, hope, and love? What does it look like to lean into this community and say, I need encouragement? You see how Paul ends this passage? Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Paul says, you will need encouragement in this regard. So keep doing it. Live in the light. You have nothing to fear. Tell the people in your parish. Tell your pastors. Tell your friends. Tell your spouses. This is the darkness that I've realized that I've been tempted to pursue. And you can do so without fear, knowing that the day of judgment is not, uh, is not coming for those who are in Christ. Not because of your vigilance. Not because of your sobriety. But because of God's love for you. And so... Let us pursue faith, hope, and love uh, with God's help until Christ comes back. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word, for the time in your word this morning that you, we've been given to study, to consider, to be invited to what is most important. Lord, please wake us up to the world around us. Where we are sleeping, Lord, please wake us up. Please shine light into the dark places by your spirit because we know that where the spirit is, that where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, not shame and despair and bondage. Where, there's a brother, where there are brothers and sisters who are given over to drunkenness, whether literally or whether figuratively with respect to some issue that is threatening sober-mindedness, where there is powerlessness, Lord, I pray that you would wake them up to the fact that there is no such thing as a chain that you cannot break in our life. There is no unbelief that you cannot pierce by your spirit. There is no despair that you cannot renew by your spirit. There is no hatred or animosity or relational division that you cannot mend and heal by your spirit. We get to be people of light, made children of light, not through our own good, but by your love alone, pursuing faith, hope, and love imperfectly, inordinately grateful for the fact that we are not saved by the demonstration of our faith, hope, and love, but that these are simply responses that you are bringing about us through your love for us. And so please, Lord, continue to minister to us by your spirit. Help us to be people, brothers, sisters, 
who comfort one another, who encourage one another, who build one another up, because this is what it means to love one another. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.